Well, I guess we're going to get started. It looks like there's a few seats here. Uh, people are standing. You do have an opportunity to fit in here. Um, and welcome to everybody. This is the Durham Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. And I'm just really glad to have you all here today. Uh, I'm Mike Fleming, and I'm the Green Sanctuary Chair of this congregation. And uh, we're very proud of our church because three years ago we became the first church in New Hampshire to be solar powered. Mm -hmm. And we're really happy about that. However, the credit should be passed around to other people, other churches in this town. So I'd like to recognize, in particular, uh, Maggie Morrison. Maggie, are you here? Maggie's back there. Yay. She started the whole idea of solar churches in this town five years ago. So she was way ahead of us and, uh, and what her work did her work uh, led us along. I also want to recognize Mary Woodward from, uh, by the way, uh, Maggie is from the community church, and Mary Woodward, way in the back there, is uh, from St. Thomas More Church right down the road here at Catholic Church. <laughs> so these are really all great people, and, and, and we're all really concerned about, about climate change. Um, and we're happy to, this church is happy to, to host everybody here. Um, Climate change is perhaps uh, more a moral issue than anything else. The question is, will we keep on our current path, or will we save our Earth for our children and make it a livable, livable world? If we're serious about that, uh, we can't ignore climate change, and we can't be happy or self-satisfied with having some LED lights in our houses. We need to have, we need to find out ways that our country and world can solve the problem of climate change. And if we're serious about solving climate change, there are really five essential things we need to do. The first, we need to find a solution that is effective. It can't be token, it can't be a partial solution. Number two, we have to have a solution that's fair. We can't have a solution that makes the disparities in our country worse than they already are. Number three, we want solutions that make our economy better and not worse. Number four, we need solutions that can happen as soon as possible because every day we don't do anything makes things worse. And number five, maybe the hardest, is we need to find solutions that last a very long time, lasts until the end of the century. That means 20 changes, or at least 20 elections for president, <laughs> and maybe that many changes in, in, in political parties. So that's a real challenge. And I'm hoping that, um, that at this forum, we will hear some ideas from Governor Inslee and from the panel that'll help us envision how we can meet all five of those criteria. So that's all I have to say, and I want to hand, I, I want to thank again Governor Inslee and his campaign for bringing the issue of climate change here. Uh, we're just thrilled to be able to do this, even though churches cannot and will not endorse political candidates. This is, this is something special. So I'll turn over the microphone to Chuck Hotchkiss of the Community Church, who will be the Master of Ceremonies tonight. Thank you. Actually, no microphone rise, both Maggie and Mary, because Mike, Maggie, and Mary and I uh, really uh, are the ones who put this event together, but without the three of them, uh, I certainly could not have done it alone. Uh, as Mike said, my name is Chuck Hotchkiss. Uh, I've been a Durham resident since uh, 2000, and uh, I've been asked to uh, sort of moderate tonight's event. I want to describe the program just for a minute. We're going to, uh, after a short introduction, we're going to hear first from our guest, uh, Washington Governor Jay Inslee. Uh, 
when the governor is done with his remarks, we're going to uh, ask our panelists who are assembled up here, uh, give them the opportunity uh, to ask some questions. They are primed and ready to go. Um, after that, uh, with whatever time we have left, we will open it up for uh, input and questions from the larger audience. Uh, now, our time, I know, is going to be limited because uh, the governor has yet another engagement after this, this evening, uh, but we will uh, do our best to make the most of the time that we have available. So with that, I would like to uh, introduce Governor Jay Inslee. Um, he is a, a three-term uh, past member of Congress, and since 2013, he has been the governor of the state of Washington. Uh, one of the foremost states when it comes to clean energy. As governor, he created a new clean energy fund, which has invested more than $100 million in developing and deploying innovative energy technologies and growing clean energy businesses and jobs. He passed the largest and greenest transportation infrastructure investment program in state history, and he started the Clean Energy Institute at the University of Washington, which is pioneering research into next generation renewable energy technologies, such as solar and battery storage. While Governor Inslee has made his reputation addressing climate change, he also has a long list of accomplishments on a variety of important issues. So here's what The Atlantic had to say about that. On his watch, the state has boosted health care, increased access to early childhood education and college, raised the minimum wage, expanded paid family leave, invested in infrastructure, and established in-state net neutrality, all while leading the country in job growth, overall personal income growth, and GDP. <laughs> Governor Inslee is also a husband. He is a father of three and grandfather of three. Uh, he is an avid cyclist and hiker and author, artist, and illustrator. And I have to say, I feel like a real slacker after <laughs> telling you all that. But uh, please join me in giving a warm New Hampshire welcome to Governor Jay Inslee. Thank you. It is a delight to be here. I want to thank you for that really kind introduction. That would have uh, pleased my mother and surprised my father. So <laughs> I want to thank you for that. Uh, Mike, I want to thank you for your words of wisdom. I think you hit everything right on the button. I am really, really glad you're not in this race for president. I, I, it would be very tough to, to challenge you, and I want to thank you uh, for your hospitality. I want to thank this community for opening this beautiful uh, room to us. I, I feel daunted. Uh, being in this room, because uh, when you're in a house of faith, uh, you are in the house of the ultimate fact checker, uh, the, the divine, and so it puts an additional burden on your shoulders. I will attempt to fulfill a responsibility. Uh, I'm Jay Inslee, I'm governor of the state of Washington. Uh, I'm running for president for one profoundly uh, compelling reason to me, and that is I believe the next president of the United States has to make defeating climate change the number one priority and the number one job in the United States. On a moral economic uh, reason, that should be the destiny of the United States to lead the world to a clean energy future. That is my fundamental belief. And it is the reason I'm running for president of the United States. I have three grandchildren. I'm very committed to them. And I know that we have one chance and one chance only to solve this problem to defeat climate change. We know we are the first generation to feel the sting of climate change. And we know we are the last generation who can do something about it. And I believe that when you only have one chance, you seize it. And I believe we ought to seize this moment. And I believe it is a moment. It's a magic moment for two reasons. One, this is a matter of urgent peril. But it is also a matter of tremendous promise of economic rebirth from growing, uh, growing clean energy jobs across the United States. I want to address the peril first. The peril is obvious, but I want, I want to note it. Um, I was in Paradise, California about a month ago. This is in a, a town of 25,000. I drove for about an hour in the darkness. Not a soul left in town. 
Uh, houses burned down on the foundation. The vast majority of the houses were total losses. It looked like a, an apocalypse movie set in Hollywood. But it was a vision into the near future for vast swaths, particularly the Western United States, where the climate, show, climate science shows unequivocally that we will have probably twice as many of intense and cataclysmic forest fires in the upcoming decades because of climate change. All we have now in the White House is a man who says if we just rake the leaves a little better, we will not have this problem. We need leadership that will confront this. And we need to confront it because it is touching so much of our lives. Uh, in my state, last summer, we had a number of days where we could not open the public pools because the air quality was too threatening to our children to allow our children to go outside and play. Houston had catastrophic floods. When I was in Iowa a few weeks ago, the farmers couldn't go out to do harvest because there was so much rainfall, it was too muddy to actually go out and harvest their fields. When I was in Miami Beach a couple months ago talking to the mayor, he showed me where they had to build up the roads a foot and a half because of the recurrent flooding, where you essentially almost get fish in Main Street in Miami Beach. We're going to have a reef formerly known as Florida if we don't do something about this problem. So this is an urgent moment. The IPCC report I know is stunning in its urgency. If you have any doubt about this, a book I just finished reading called The Uninhabitable Earth, uh, it, it is an eye-opener and it is a suggestion that we need to get moving. Now that is the peril side, which is obvious to everyone in this room, but is not obvious to the person in the White House who says that this is a, a Chinese uh, hoax. And it's unfortunate that the most technologically gifted, scientifically literate community in the history of the planet would have someone who's so uh, stopping progress in this regard. So we need another president who will deal with this peril. But I believe the, the depth of that peril is matched by the economic promise of the opportunities available to us. Because we know there's going to be a giant transition to a decarbonized economy. And we know that will involve creation of whole new industries. And we know something about the United States. This is what we do. We invent, we create, we build. We're the master innovators. We build new industries. We built the first commercial jet airliner in Seattle, the first artificial kidney machine. We mastered digital economics. We even invented the $4 cup of coffee in <laughs> Seattle. So we know that this is our, in our wheelhouse of inventing new technologies. And that is why it is so perfect for an economic rebirth across the United States. And this is happening. Look, jobs in clean energy are growing twice faster than the average in the US economy. The number one fastest job creation category is in solar installer. Number two is in wind turbine technician. So we know we're growing clean energy jobs across the United States. It is such a joy to meet entrepreneurs and skilled people. I started this effort in Iowa, my first visit as a candidate was to Cedar Rapids where I met a business guy that started a little solar business. Now he's hiring IBW union members and they're just going gangbusters on solar energy, building crazy amounts of, of batteries for electric cars. By the way, I, I had something. There's a car out in the parking lot. Its license plate is EVPV2. Could you tell me who's car EVPV2. Yeah. I just want to tell you I love you because the carbon in your car was made in Moses Lake, Washington. Yeah. And I'm proud of your car and I feel kinship because you're putting people to work in Moses Lake, Washington, a small town east, uh, east of Seattle. Can we give a round of applause for a friend of Washington? Uh, I think I being made where it was as late, then of course goes into the BMW through SGL. But with, there's another company there, Torrey Composite. Oh, yes. And that material, again, is carbon. That's our business. Oh, that's your business? Our, our, no, no, not Torrey. <laughs> <laughs> but we make carbon fiber parts. Oh, great. And, and we're, one of, we're a very unusual company in that most of our material is excellent. Awesome. So. This, That's an example of the new energy economy. Yeah. It's so exciting to meet you. What's your name? Jim Dreer. 
Jim, it's really exciting to meet you, and I'll tell you why. Um, 11 years ago, I wanted to create a vision for the country about how to create a clean energy economy. And I wrote a book, it was called Apollo's Fire, Igniting America's Clean Energy Economy. The movie rights are still available, by the way. <laughs> but in the book, I wrote about the potential of, of carbon fiber becoming major parts of our automobiles. And I thought that was a real potential 11 years ago. And I wrote about a little, book, a little company called Fiber Forge in Colorado. Yeah. They were making little parts for BMWs to put in the trunk, the little trunk well. And now to hear about your progress is very exciting to me to see this development. So this is happening, but we have to accelerate the rate of change. We know we have to decarbonize our economy in the next several decades. We know we're capable of doing that if we have a spark of imagination. And I, I'm a, uh, a child of the 60s. I remember John F. Kennedy say we're going to the moon. We know that unified America. We know that list it lifted the ambitions of America. And I believe that same spark can ignite a clean energy revolution in the United States. We just need a little leadership. Now, we need to do a few other things as well. We need to defeat the stranglehold of the fossil fuel industry on our politics. And that's why I'm <coughs> pledging not to take a dollar from the fossil fuel industry. It's why I'm saying that we have to end the subsidies and billions of dollars going to the fossil fuel industry. That gravy train has got to be over. Because we have to make this an economy that is rational, which allows the clean energy, the new, na the new nascent uh, economies of the future, to blossom. We know we have to remove the structural policies that have, that have created so much dysfunction in Washington, D.C., including the filibuster. Look, Mitch McConnell has weaponized the filibuster. We're not going to be able to pass climate change unless we eliminate the filibuster. We've got to remove the electoral college because people's votes can actually count. We need to do structural things to really give a rebirth of democracy, and I'm committed to doing those things. And I'm confident in my ability to do this because I have been a chief executive of one of the most successful states in the nation. And I believe in uh, doing things rather than just talking about them. There's nothing wrong with speeches, but actually getting things done is even better, I've learned. And we've got a lot done in my state. You heard about some of our accomplishments. And they basically are wrapped around a central precept that we should build a middle-out economy rather than a top-down economy. <coughs> Trickle-down economics has not worked. Middle-out economics has worked. That's why I'm proud to have the best family paid leave in America. One of the biggest minimum paid uh, minimum wage increases. The first net neutrality uh, statute in the United States. Some of the best voting rights so everyone gets to vote. Two huge bipartisan successes in transportation infrastructure. And a giant increase in educational funding. And uh, legalizing marijuana, which I think should be the law of the United States soon and offering pardons to 3,000 people so we can start to end the racial disparities in the drug war. These are things America needs. And I hope that the fruits of that progress in my state can be enjoyed by people all across the United States. And I intend, if I'm giving that honor, to fight to make sure that that does happen. So I'm confident of our ability to make this progress. Uh, I'm confident of our ability to fashion a more just, a more equitable society. And I have to get something off my chest uh, in that vein. Uh, when I heard Donald Trump, uh, in response to the shootings in New Zealand, use exactly the same language as the person who was responsible for that terrible violence, to talk about the invaders, to talk about the other, it just made my blood boil. And I think we need a president who will help unite us rather than sow division. And that is why I'm proud that I am the first governor in the United States to have stood up against his Muslim ban to try to stop his pernicious fear mongering in the United States. And I feel strongly about the continuation of those efforts and looking forward to having a president that can respond to the higher uh, angels and better angels of our nature. I think it's time for a president to do that. So I want to thank you for a chance to say hello. I don't know if we're taking questions now or at the end. What's the protocol? I, I think we need to move to our panel. Governor, Great. Because we're running a little Thank behind. you very much. Before we do that, uh, 
and go to our panel, I do want to recognize one special guest we have in attendance. Uh, Senator John Morgan is with us, State Senator Morgan. And up here we have flanking the governor of uh, four New Hampshire residents and citizens with particular knowledge and concerns about climate change. We're going to keep this informal, so I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves as uh, they uh, respond and pose uh, questions to the governor about mm -hmm. issues that are particular to folks here in New Hampshire. Beginning with the man with the microphone, Tom Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Tom Morgan. I'm the uh, town planner for the town of Seabrook, New Hampshire. It's the uh, town is the site of, I think you all know, the, the largest nuclear power plant in New England. Um, and, and the issues we're looking at are, uh, of course, a rising sea, and the rising sea is pushing up the groundwater. So we have we have um, we have a few issues that are uh, of concern. But my question to the governor yeah. is, Governor, um, could you tell us how your uh, approach to climate issues differs from the other folks who are running for the Democratic nomination? Uh, yes, yeah, thank you. He, I he's this works. Um, I think I have a unique position in this regard in a variety of ways. Uh, the most important one is I'm the only candidate who has said unequivocally that this has to be the first priority of the United States. Uh, I've learned as a governor, <laughs> I've learned it as a, to govern is to choose, and that, that means to set priorities. And I've learned that this has to be a job number one or it won't get done. And the reason is, is because it requires such political capital in the entire mobilization of the United States economy to this purpose. To decarbonize the United States economy is an enormous undertaking. It cannot be done casually, and it will not be done if we just have a president who sort of checks the climate change box or says that this is one thing on the, on the to-do list. This has to be the central defining mission statement of the United States, and the only way that can happen is if we have presidential leadership to actually do, do that. Number two, this is something that has been the compelling passion of my life for at least two decades. When I ran for Congress in a very Republican, red agricultural small town district in Central Washington in 1992, I ran on a plank of defeating carbon dioxide pollution. This was in 1992. Uh, I'm the candidate who co-authored a book on this in 2007 who started the Sustainable Energy and Environment Coalition in the House in about 2008, who helped found the United States Climate Alliance a, several, a couple of years ago, the day at, within 24 hours of Donald Trump saying he was going to pull out of Paris. Jerry Brown and Andrew Cuomo and I had stood up the U.S. Climate Alliance. We now have 21 states in the Climate Alliance committed to the Paris Agreement. And I thought this was very important because we wanted the rest of the world to know there's intelligent life in the United States. <laughs> and that they should not give up on us in America. And it's been very successful. Virtually no one has except maybe Putin in Brazil. Not even Putin. So uh, I think these are unique qualifications. The third one I would list is uh, I'm the governor with successful policies that we've got done. We've created a $6 billion wind turbine industry. We are one of the leading states in electrifying our transportation system. I'm the first governor to build electric ferry boats that run on electricity, or will be shortly, I hope. We have started a Clean Energy Research Institute at the University of Washington. And this year, because finally, for the first time, we've got a Democratic majority, working majority, we're passing bills for a 100% clean electricity grid, a clean fuel standard, a net zero building standard for commercial buildings, a bill to outlaw super pollutants, and a new bill to have zero emission vehicles. So I think those all are unique qualifications, but I think all of my opponents are eminently qualified to be vice president. I speak for you. I'm Mindy Mesmer. I am former state representative for Rye. I got involved in this issue uh, because I ran for Congress basically on this issue as well. Uh, drinking water contamination and climate change are the top two threats for national security, as I'm sure you know. And um, I'd like to ask you if we can clone you, because we need a governor here that we can, <laughs> we're all talking about all these bills we can get through with the Democratic majorities we have in the state, and then and, and, and we can't get them through the governor, likely. But 
Anyway, uh, so we, uh, I got involved in this because of the cancer rates in the seacoast. I identified a pediatric cancer cluster, and then kind of come to find out that we also have the highest rates of bladder, breast, esophageal, and pediatric cancer in the entire country here in New Hampshire. And I contend that's environmentally related. At least, at least half of it can be prevented that way. I have a background now in public health as well. I'm an environmental scientist. Um, and uh, so that's what has gotten me involved in this. We have to protect our drinking water. And when we're looking at sea level rise, coming in and you know, coming into our aquifers, it, we are going to have to really protect our water. So uh, nationally, we know that, for instance, LA County has a two and a half month longer vector-borne disease um, season now due to climate change. Uh, so healthcare is a big issue of mine. Um, and we know here in New Hampshire that $645 million worth of residential real estate is at risk on the seacoast right now due to sea level um, rise, which is a $9 million um, property tax base. A hundred commercial properties are at risk right now, um, in between now and 2045. So this is a big economic issue as well as a health issue. Um, and I guess my question to you is, um, what is your position on health care? How can we provide health care for everyone, especially when so many people are sick and more will become sick? Yeah. Well, the first thing on health care is, is let's stop uh, causing greater epidemics of asthma because of air pollution in our kids and COPD problems, and increasing infectious diseases. We were just, uh, I was just in another meeting where, you know, uh, the moose populations here are down like 60% because of the tick infestations moving north. And I know we got a crisis because my brother-in-law, who's 72 years old, he and I have been hiking all over the mountains of Washington for 60, 70 years. He finally, the first time he ever got a tick, and he got this giant kind of mass of scar tissue now. When my brother-in-law has a problem because of the tick, that's a crisis, okay, in my mind, in my view. So I just wanted to talk about that health risk. Big issue in health care, but uh, I believe that universal health care access uh, is a right. And we need to move forward as rapidly as we can in that direction. Uh, we are now, I hope, will be the first state with a public option. I've introduced a public option bill in my state, so on a state basis we can give people access to health care through a public option. We are integrating our physical and mental health, which I think is really important. It's crazy to have separate systems. We are unified people. And integrating our mental and physical health, I think, is very important. I believe that increasing access to Medicare is a short-term thing we can do to reduce the age where you're eligible and to allow people to buy into Medicare. So we can have Medicare for all who want it, basically. I also believe ideas of allowing automatic enrollment of people when they're born so that you enter the, by default the Medicare system to allow a more universal system. Those are ideas to start with. It's a long uh, uh, process. I look forward to working with you. By the way, I want to thank you for running. I want to I tell you I hope you run again. Uh, you and I have both lost congressional races now, so we're tied. <laughs> I, lost, I lost a congressional race in 1994. I represented a real rural uh, red area, and we were three votes short of passing the assault weapon bill. And Bill Clinton uh, asked me to vote for the bill, and, and Chuck Schumer, and I said, uh, you know, I'll lose my seat if I do this. And they said, yeah, we don't care. <laughs> I cared. Uh, but I did believe that was the right vote in 1994. I believe it now, and I'm proud to say that we have, during my governorship, have now passed three measures to advance common sense gun legislation and not continue to work on those issues. So keep the faith. Hey, my name is Michael Behrman. I'm the uh, Director of Business Development for Clean Energy New Hampshire. That's uh, the leading organization in the state advocating for policy and market changes to expand clean tech jobs and the deployment of clean energy within our state and moving towards a clean economy. Uh, my background is really, I've, I've dedicated really my entire academic and professional career towards the issue of climate change and deploying clean energy and other um, types of, of technologies to resolve this issue. And uh, I'm, I've got a two-year-old daughter now, which is made the issue become that much more apparent to me. Uh, but I focus a lot on the economy, on the economic side of this, the economic development potential. Um, and one of the things that 
we've been working on for years is trying to, to showcase how much opportunity there really is by moving towards a clean economy and specifically in New Hampshire. And what's really interesting to me is some of the approaches you've taken for Washington uh, to help spur the industries there within clean tech uh, to deploy more energy. I'm, I'm of a similar mindset where I get tired of talking and I just want to do it. And so, you know, I'm curious to see what measures you've taken, what you've seen work well. We have an issue here in New Hampshire where despite having one of the leading states in the country in Massachusetts just to ourselves, we don't like Massachusetts for some reason. Um, so I'm, I'm really curious to see what you've done that you've seen work well, how you've engaged both the businesses that are trying to push the issue of clean energy and clean tech forward, but also the businesses that aren't quite there and what you're messaging and how you've approached that to really pull them along as well. Uh, well, this is, uh, look, the best thing I can do in this regard is to run for president. <laughs> in part because I have a chance to talk to America to display all of this great progress that's going on. Um, there's just so many jobs being created, and one of my joys is everywhere I go, I just try to display the progress that's going on that a lot of people just aren't aware of. You know, I think about Grays Harbor, Washington, who was kind of an economically uh, troubled area. Well, now we're making biofuels there, right? We're, we're making biofuels that fly jet airplanes even. We've flown a jet airplane across the Atlantic Ocean. We've, we've, we've flown F-18s with biofuels now that is being refined. I, we, we talk about SGL in, in, in Moses Lake. And we talk about retrofitting houses, which is in every district, right? And this is not, you don't have to be a rocket science. One of the beauties of the clean energy economy is that everyone has a role. The carpenter, the electrical worker, the machinist, the iron worker, everybody has some role potentially in this economic revolution. The other thing I do is, is for those who are statistically minded is to share these statistics. So like this isn't like some pipe dream or hallucination. The statistics back us up. Clean energy jobs are going twice as fast as the US economy. People don't know that, so uh, it's kind of handy to, to have a, a bully pulpit when, when you run for president in this regard. And what I, I will tell you the most effective thing I have found, though, is individual stories, like yourself, uh, going to tell those stories. And I encourage people to be leaders in this regard. I, I encourage everybody, you don't have to run for president to be a leader on this. Everybody here is in a social network. And I actually encourage you to share what we talked about tonight in your social network. You're as important as I am in this social revolution. Every social revolution starts in a small room. This is a relatively small room. And we can affect a thousand people's opinions from the group that's in this room tonight. And I hope that you will uh, you'll share those stories. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine Corkery. I'm from New Hampshire Sierra Club. Thank you all for having me here. Um, and it's really exciting to and refreshing to have a leader in this conversation uh, because we don't always get that chance. So thank you for coming and, and speaking directly to this issue of climate change. Um, I'm not sure if I see any of the students who were out yesterday in this room, um, but there were a lot of students talking about the need to stop what we're doing from the fossil fuel economy and switching to the clean uh, energy economy. And um, it's hard to do that. Uh, but here in New Hampshire, we are trying. We have a program, a unique program, um, called the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. And this, uh, we affectionately call it Reggie. Um, like your older brother. Uh, it has had a lot of changes in New Hampshire, but the, there are still some challenges with it, and we see those challenges. Um, it's a program where uh, power plants are yep. uh, required to pay to pollute, and so they get an, an, a certain amount of, of money uh, to reduce that pollution. And uh, here in New Hampshire, uh, uh, there are nine states that are part of this program. 
And, and they employ wonderful <coughs> programs. There are financial programs, um, matching funds, and low interest loans, and it's so creative and great. Uh, here in New Hampshire, we have rebates. Uh, and there are three different classes of ratepayers in New Hampshire. We've got the commercial class, the industrial class, and then the residential class. That's us. The first two get rebates for the energy that they would have paid towards Reggie. We don't. They get 100% rebates. Um, so out of the last uh, session, there were $11 million for New Hampshire designated from the Reggie program. Only $3 million was put towards projects in New Hampshire. The rest was rebated to the commercial class and the industrial class. But with that $3 million, gosh darn it, we did a lot. And um, we're really excited to actually change that process here in New Hampshire uh, with a bill. And what has been very discouraging is that it is a political decision. We had none of our friends on the other side of the aisle vote in support of this bill, of this change, for making all of the ratepayer classes pay into the Reggie program. So we'd actually have $11 million to work on low income and to um, provide for schools and public buildings. Um, and uh, my question to you, is how, how do we deal with this divide and scale up some of the, some of the good seeds and, and grow those programs within our structure so that it, 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 it addresses those issues that you talked about, the just and fair transition uh, to the clean energy economy and to create jobs and to improve our health care. Yeah, well, um, to address this issue of a divide, I think we should really keep our hearts and minds open to folks in the other party uh, who want to participate in helping build a clean energy economy. Uh, I have done that at some time. I stood right next to Senator John McCain when we introduced the cap and trade bill. It's sort of like your energy bill uh, years ago. Uh, I worked with a congressman named Walter Jones uh, who uh, we just lost a couple weeks ago, actually, in trying to allow the Pentagon to use uh, biofuels in their operations, and it's been very successful. Uh, Ray Mabus, a friend who was Secretary of the Navy, got us, he, he started what's called the Green Fleet to operate ships on biofuels and F-18s. It's been very, very successful. So we can work across the aisle. We do have three governors who are Republicans in the U.S. Climate Alliance that we started, and we appreciate their participation. Uh, there are a few Republicans in the Congress who dare to say the word climate change, which is nice. That's a start. Uh, there have been a few Republicans who have embraced the idea of a revenue neutral carbon charge of one nature or another. That's a start. I don't think it's adequate to the challenge. We have to be much bolder and much bigger. But we've got to uh, be adept to look at those opportunities. However, and here's there's always a however, the situation in the Senate right now is is long as Mitch McConnell has a filibuster at his disposal, he will stop any meaningful climate change legislation. His caucus is unfortunately dominated by climate deniers who are afraid of Donald Trump like afraid of their shadow. And as we saw in the vote on the wall the other day, they are just afraid to cross him. So the only way we will be able to uh, advance meaningful climate legislation uh, in the short term is to uh, elect more Democrats and, and eliminate the filibuster. That will open the gates to progress and I hope to be a president to lead us to do that. As far as the, uh, I'm really fascinated and I'd like to talk to you offline more about this issue uh, in, in New Hampshire. Uh, I think if Molly Kelly would have been elected and I'm a huge admirer of hers, that she could have helped. But uh, there will be other elections and I hope they come soon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Applause for all of our <laughs> Uh, Governor, 
is you've already learned uh, the knowledge and expertise about climate change is not limited to the folks flanking you up yes. here. We've already had an example of that. Uh, we have about 15 minutes available for uh, questions from others in the audience. So I want to uh, open that up at this time, and I will come around with the uh, microphone. Yes. Um, yeah, hi, Bob Woodward. I don't know whether I need the mic. You sound yeah. pretty good, Bob. The, um, the word socialism <coughs> has been used as a, a criticism of democratic efforts for health care, uh, for equity, uh, social security. Uh, the difficulty is, with that word is we don't understand it on the one hand. On the other hand, the uh, concept of the governmental support of the petroleum industry, the coal industry, is a kind of socialism that really is the government support paid by other people that the Republicans are trying to uh, criticize changes uh, in Social Security and health care. How can we combat that? Well, I look, if, if hypocrisy was a fatal disease, the cemeteries would be full. <laughs> is the situation you pointed out the subsidization of the fossil fuel industry. We just combat it by giving Americans good common sense solutions to their, to their problems, as we did when we created Social Security, as we did when we created Medicare, as we did when we passed civil rights, as we did when we passed health care. And you just got to work through those things. And I went through the health care battle. We're seeing a repeat. We're seeing this movie again. Because you recall during the health care reform battle, what did they talk about? They talked about death panels. They said that we're going to be, the government will be deciding whether you get medical care or not. Now we're seeing a, a version of that. I was in a debate with Megan McCain the other day, who she was saying that we're going to take away everybody's cars. We're going to take everybody's trains, and it was just a bunch of baloney. And you just have to work through that and hope that Americans and trust in Americans' vision statement, and we will ultimately prevail on this. We have to prevail. It's a little like Winston Churchill said, you know, why do you, why do you think we have to win? And he says, well, victory is the only option, because without victory, there's no survival. So that's a good way to look at this. And we also have the advantage um, is pointing to all these entrepreneurs who are leading this clean energy revolution. The vast majority of the equity for this revolution is going to be private equity. The vast number of people who are going to create these organizations are going to be entrepreneurs. The vast majority of employees who do this work are going to be private employees. We just want to make sure they have a family wage when they do that work. And I think that's a healthy view of an American economy. And when we do this, I do believe we have to make sure we have a just transition mm -hmm. to a decarbonized economy, not just a transition. That means we have to focus on the frontline communities, the marginalized communities, the, the communities of color and poverty. They're always the first victims of climate change. Mm -hmm. And if we do this, this will be a mechanism of reducing inequality and increasing economic and social justice. That's why this is so exciting. This is not just about making a buck. It's about making a more just society. And I think we can do that. No words there. Uh, because climate change does seem to be tied to everything else. But one of the questions that's going to come up is, how are you going to pay for it? And along that line, could you tell us if you would support the tax proposals we heard from um, Congressman uh, Cortez to bounce the um, marginal rates on the wealthy people up? And how do you feel about Senator Warren's wealth tax idea? So uh, when it comes to paying it, when people ask me that question, uh, the first thing I should ask them, how are you going to pay for the paradise of California that got burned down? How are you going to pay for the nine, for the billion dollars of property value that are being swallowed up by the rising sea levels on New Hampshire coastline? How are you going to pay for Norfolk, California, where the Navy is, is tearing their hair out how to deal with having their dry docks getting flooded? How are you going to pay for the fact that my kids have an epidemic of asthma? The fact is, is that the course of inaction is the most expensive action. The fact that our towns are burning down to the foundations of the houses, that's an economic loss. And that's a lot cheaper to prevent that than to allow our towns to burn down. 
So I believe this will be the least cost action in the face of climate change. Look, there are assessments that by the end of this century, and don't hold me to these exact numbers, but something like reductions of our GDP of like 15 or 20 percent, while we have 100 million people. This is like a 20 or 30 percent in our living standards by the end of the century. So the fact of the matter is the least cost option is to try to prevent the devastation of climate change. Now, how to finance some of these things? Uh, we do it the old-fashioned way. People put private equity into these businesses. A Paulson Electric in Cedar Rapids, um, um, a and Solar in Seattle, Washington. a and Solar is where I kicked off my campaign. Uh, seven years ago, they had two employees. Now they have 70 employees. He's bringing in private capital. He's putting people to work. He's paying wages. Those people are going out and buying shoes for their kids and, and electric cars and everything else and building an economy. That's how we do it. We invest in ourselves. And where there's economic activity, there's economic growth. So I think that those who think that somehow this is going to hurt our economy, A, forget the fact that passivity is destroying our economy, and forget the fact that when Americans build new technologies, we make out like bandits. And I believe we can do that again in the United States. Oh, and you asked the question about taxes. Mm -hmm. um, sure it is. So my belief, <laughs> my belief is that we have to have a more progressive tax structure through some measure or measures to shift the tax burden away from working people to more of the top uh, folks in the upper quintiles and 1% of, of, of our tax base. The first order of business is to repeal the tax, the Trump tax cut, which was grossly unfair to working people. Then there are options to consider. Uh, I have not landed on any particular option. Uh, I'm open to ideas, but I'll just give you an idea how this is not just rhetorical with me. I have proposed in my state to create our first capital gains tax. Rather than putting the tax burden on working people, to put it on the top 1.5% of people in my state. And I think that's the fair thing to do. We have unbelievable amounts of wealth created in my, in my state. I admire the people who have done this. But when you look at the burden, it should not be on the working people. It should be the people who do well. Great school kids. Thank you. 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 Thank and I'm wondering, in your state as governor, what you've done um, as far as public environmental ed. Yes. Um, uh, well, I really believe in this mission because my dad was a biology teacher. And I meet people all over the state of Washington whose lives were changed because of what my dad did for them to give them promise and confidence in themselves. And the best thing I've done, you won't see this coming, the single best thing I've done for public education in climate change is I've given our teachers one of the biggest pay raises they've ever had in the state of Washington. Because we have to have well-paid, compensated teachers. And we've also increased uh, significantly our science, technology, engineering, and math programs. We've had a 600% increase in our students who are taking advanced plays, placement in computer science, for instance. And I have been personally involved in making sure that our curriculum about climate science is rigorous. I'll tell you how committed I am to this. I wanted to make sure that our curriculum was appropriate. So I've actually went down and looked at the test questions that we ask our students to make sure that we're teaching them the right things. I had to sign 12 affidavits that I wouldn't tell anybody what's on the test. <laughs> and if your kids are taking the test, I'm not going to tell you what's on the test. I'm sorry, I'm bound to secrecy. So this is a high priority for me. I will tell you we're having substantial success because young people get this. And I was so inspired yesterday to march with thousands of young people in New York. I was really inspired to march, uh, turn the corner in Columbus Circle and see these kids marching past the Trump Tower holding signs saying, please let us breathe, holding sign that said, there is, no, uh, there is no planet B. These are the generation that are challenging us. We ought to respond to that challenge. And we ought to listen to my 10-year-old grandson who said, uh, he turned to me one time, we were on a hike a few weeks ago, and he said, this is appropriate. It came out of nowhere. He said, Bobo, that's my name, Bobo. 
Uh, he said, Bobo, we are all nature. And I said, this kid's brilliant. So anyway, that's what he's <laughs> Our more reticent uh, participants here tonight asked me to uh, pose a question to you. Yeah. And that is, uh, I'm sure that as you were deciding whether or not to jump in the race, you had to judge, if you ran, what is the political path to victory? Mm -hmm. And so that is the question, sir. What is the political path to victory for your campaign? We're here right tonight. This is the path right here. So thank you for being here. Uh, it's through Iowa, New Hampshire, and Nevada, and South Carolina, and California, and all the other states. It's doing what I love to do, which is retail politics. And I love retail politics. It's how I got elected uh, three out of four times in a red 62% Republican small town agricultural district in central Washington, which reminds me very much of the small town communities in, in Iowa, New Hampshire, and Nevada. This feels like home to me. I know how to win against Republicans. I started my governor's race 16 points behind. In 2012, I beat an incumbent Republican, one of only two Democrats who beat incumbent Republicans in 1998. And I beat three out of four times candidates in this red Republican area until I voted for the assault weapon ban, and then came back in Congress later on. So I believe that when you provide people a positive vision, you can win. And I'm getting a great response. I have to tell you, we've, this is our fourth event in New Hampshire. It's been in full rooms every time we've been here. People are responding. They know deep in their hearts that we only have one chance left to defeat climate change. And they know giving a Democratic nominee is extremely important in that regard. So I feel very good about this. Uh, I don't know whether this is appropriate in House of Worship, but I will tell you, all of you have a First Amendment right to go to my website and make some First Amendment contribution, if you'd like. <laughs> I want to make sure you understand. We, we have time for just one or two more, perhaps back here. Uh, thank you. So you're making climate change a priority, and you're elected president. I want to know what legislation, as a leader, you're taking a leadership role here, what will you propose to Congress? And specifically, would you address the possibility of cap and trade legislation or carbon tax, or do you have other ideas? Yeah. Well, we're going to roll out a very comprehensive <laughs> policy document uh, a little bit later in the campaign, but so I'm going to go through real quickly. The kind of things that we need to do nationally, I believe, are the kind of things that we believe we're going to have success in the state of Washington. 100% clean electrical grid, a clean fuel standard, uh, building codes that give us net zero uh, commercial buildings, elimination of super pollutants, incentive programs to help people get act to acquire electric cars and solar panels in the light. Really significant increase in research and development. Infrastructure development that will emphasize both putting people to work and building infrastructure, which gives us a clean economy. That includes huge increases in transportation infrastructure. We have $70 billion of transportation infrastructure in my state right now, 70% of which is in clean, or low carbon public transportation issues, and we can do the same thing. We need new schoolhouses all over America, and when we build them, we ought to build them so kids have clean air, and we don't waste taxpayers' money on utility bills. So these are the kind of things, this is just a, a quick summary of the kind of things that we need to propose. As far as a carbon pricing system, either through a cap and trade system like REGI, or a direct carbon tax, my view is we should not eliminate the possibility of doing those. Uh, I, I don't know whether I will propose one or not. Uh, you will know in several weeks. But I don't think we should eliminate that possibility. But I will say this. What I have found, we had a carbon tax on our ballot that did not pass this year, in part because the fossil fuels industry spent $32 million to convince people that this was not Washington's future. That's one of the reasons I've pledged not to take fossil fuel money and why I've been so adamantly opposed to the fossil fuel stranglehold of democracy. Uh, but my, what I have found is, is that we have multiple ways of building a decarbonized economy, not just a carbon price. For instance, in the initiative that we did not pass, 90% of the carbon savings came from the investment side. The investment helping people get a clean energy cars and solar panels in communities and building more energy efficient buildings. 
rather than the price signal side. So 90% of our carbon benefits came from the non-carbon price part of the portfolio. This is actually encouraging because it means we do a lot of different things. And the bills I'm introducing now that all are moving through my legislature, I'm very happy about this, uh, uh, in total will get us roughly the same carbon pollution reduction as the initiative would have achieved. So I do believe there's a capability of moving uh, very rapidly to a decarbonized economy, possibly even without a carbon price. But stay tuned, we're going to have further discussion. Okay, I have uh, time five, so I'm, thank you. I'm not going to uh, ask for any more hands, and I am going to ask uh, our uh, participants just to uh, keep the uh, questions brief, because we are running up against a hard time deadline. Uh, Governor, you mentioned the rhetoric on the other side about taking away our cars, and, and another part of that was taking away our cows and our herders. <coughs> You're talking a lot about the, the energy side. Um, what about the food system side of the question on climate change? Well, big question. Um, I'll tell you one of the things I first think about when I think about agriculture, I think about topsoil, because I think it's one of our great treasures is our topsoil, and we ought to be concerned about our topsoil. Topsoil can either be a loss or actually a gain in the climate change fight. And I believe it can be a gain by being a place to sequester carbon dioxide in our soil at the same time, we're adopting agricultural practices that give us more protection of the stability of topsoil and more production at the same time. So I'm seeing technologies in agriculture that I think we should possibly try to find a revenue producing option for farmers to turn their topsoil into carbon sinks to get carbon out of the atmosphere and into the topsoil. At the same time, we find ways to farm that does not cause erosion. And that we are finding ways to do that. And I think we need a federal government to assist uh, in this regard. So I'm committed to those kind of, of things. And I look forward, if you've got any ideas, uh, to share with me. Uh, thank you. My, my name is Isaac Graham. I am a member of a group called Rights and Democracy. And I live just up the road in Denver. So thanks for coming to our neck of the woods. Um, and thank you for your leadership on climate change. Um, it's one of the issues that terrifies me the most as a young person. Um, but I wanted to ask you a question about something else that deeply upsets me and, and terrifies me is our military and nuclear arsenal. Um, we currently, uh, I believe, our deep, you know, we are, we, our priorities are way out of whack, right? We are prioritizing spending billions, trillions of dollars uh, on nuclear weapons, uh, on 700 plus bases around the world, and you know we have over 7,000 uh, nuclear warheads right now. It would take only 100 or so to kill billions of people. And right now we're on track to spend over a trillion dollars over the next few years on expanding our, our nuclear arsenal. So as president, would you stand against that kind of spending uh, on upgrading on, and expanding our, our nuclear arsenal? Um, and how would you help us transition to a peace economy? Thank you. Yeah, well, first off, uh, an organization called Rights for Democracy, that must terrify Republicans. Because <laughs> they must be really terrified of your group. Um, a couple things. I think there's an obvious thing and a non-obvious thing regarding nuclear weapons. First off, I think a reduction in nuclear stockpiles internationally ought to be a high priority for the world. There is no reason to have the number of nuclear weapons floating around the world that pose security threats, both by accidental discharge and the wrong people getting access to them. They are a current uh, national security threat because that nuclear material can all be used by terrorists, much less uh, rogue governments. So the reduction of the stockpiles through international agreements, I think, is a high priority. But I think maybe even a higher priority and I wish I had a blueprint for this. At this point, this is more of a vision than a blueprint. We cannot live forever in a system where nuclear weapons are on a hair trigger, where they can be fired in 15 minutes notice. Humans are too fallible. Emotions are too vitriolic. Uh, we know the chaos coming out of the White House today that makes us difficult to sleep on this issue. So we have to find ways to remove uh, or increase the time it takes to deploy nuclear weapons, in my view, through international agreements. 
The risk is just too great for an accidental exchange. So I hope to start discussions about that. Look for any ideas uh, you've got. Great, thank you. We are out of time. Uh, I do want to uh, just leave you all with one thought uh, back on the topic of climate change. Uh, and that comes from the environmentalist David Orr, who says that if we're going to effectively address climate change, uh, it's going to require transformational leaders, right? Leaders who can not only are uh, strong enough to tell the truth to people about the situation we're in, but also can help us craft a, a vision, a story, if you will, uh, that will inspire us to do the things we need to do in order to address climate change effectively. And clearly, Governor Inslee is on the path to doing that. Uh, and I hope that uh, many of you, in a more local way, are on the path to doing that as well. So thank you all for being here. Let's have another round of applause. to uh, the Durham.